That's Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. After these things, God tested Abraham and sent him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to the young man, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took his hand, the fire and the knife, so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, he said, Here I am, my son, he said. Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place which the Lord had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood. In, or in order he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from him. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. We'll have to come up. David, uh, the, next, the next reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 23. So from Romans 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? But no means... Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obey the form of, te of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body to slavery, to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you were now ashamed of? those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness. And the, and, this, and the result is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thanks, Dave. I sprung that on Dave very last minute because I, I originally planned to do the reading and then I thought, well, it's going to be a bit of me talking. I might, uh, might give you guys a rest. Um, so we're going to start worshipping in a minute. Um, we got a, a new song this morning, which is, which is good. It's always good to have something uh, fresh. It's an easy song. I'm sure you will pick up on it and uh, follow it through. It's based off the Lord's Prayer. But I just, I really think it's important when we come to come and worship, we're really preparing the soil. You know, when we, we're preparing our hearts, you know, when we hear the message and we hear the word preached, it's like the seeds, the seeds are getting scattered in that soil. So 
when it's when it's been prepared, the, the seed has more chance to grow, more chance to flourish. So, I just want to encourage you all this morning. And there's a really nice um, passage in Jeremiah, which I've just read over a few times through the week, and I thought it'd just be nice to share it. You don't have to turn there, but it's it's from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 12 to 14. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they shall languish no more. Then shall the young women rejoice in, in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness and sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. So I just want to, want to bless, bless everybody as we go into this time of worship, and just remember the goodness of the Lord. Amen. <coughs>
can all sit down if you'd like. We're, we're going to take communion now. So if I could invite Lewis up and, and Nick Dave on the table as well this morning. I, just, I really think that starting the week declaring the goodness of God and standing on that testimony of God's goodness and singing his praise is a really important way to start the week. And it's interesting, in the beginning of the book of Judges, it says that um, the Israelites are going to go to war against the Canaanites and God says, send Judah first. And I just think it's interesting that Judah means praise. And I think when we come to our week and, and, the, and the things in life, when we start with praise, we're starting it at, in a good place. Amen. It's a... Uh... Do you enjoy the worship and the praise? Um, I think this is a test run uh, because because we can improve because the more you enjoy being in God's presence, the freer you feel. I enjoy seeing hands go up and I enjoy as well hearing the voices lift up. And that's to God's glory and to God's enjoyment. I enjoyed the last, the last one that we that we are um, um, singing about wanting the kingdom of God to come to us. Are you happy with how life is? Yes. Well, I'm not <laughs> because we've been promised a new kingdom where death shall reign no more, where all our tears will be wiped where we will not grow old, where we will not go weary, <laughs> where we will not grow bold, or to the sides, will be just perfect. That's the promise. But the best thing about that kingdom is that we will see the Lord Jesus, because that's why we're here. So that's what moves us towards desiring that kingdom of God. And this morning, as you know, usually when I do communion, I read uh, 1 Corinthians 11. But because of this uh, song, I thought about something else. I remember the Gospel of Luke. Because Paul doesn't say this uh, in, in his, um, his take on the Lord's, um, on the Lord's uh, Supper. Uh, but I'd like to read you this in Luke 22. Um, I'm going to read from verse 7 and on. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters. And say to the owner of the house, The teacher asked, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and around. They left and found things Jesus, Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his disciples and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I'll tell you, I will not eat it until uh, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. When Jesus returns and he invites us to the great supper of the Lamb, then you will see that all our hopes were not in vain. But all our effort to keep away from sin, which is what the sermon will be about, we're not in vain. That your toil, that your tears, that the mockery that you suffering right now because of our faith, and some of us, not here maybe, but some of us around the world, they are suffering until death. Then their faith will be justified. And everybody will see that Jesus is Lord. I'd like to invite, um, uh, I don't have, I don't have anything. <laughs> I'd like to change them to, to pray for the prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for 
for who you are and thank you for what you've done. We just want to declare your goodness. We want to thank you for the miracle of grace, Father God. We want to thank you that you died for our sins, Father God, that we might be made whole in you and in Christ we may live. In Jesus' name. the bread in your hand when you receive it and we'll take it all together and he took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body even for you do this in remembrance of me Again, and he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the white cup. David to pray for the cup. <coughs> Our loving Father, you do invite us around this table to undertake this simple task, a task that is simple but one which is significant, and you ask us to take this wine in remembrance of you. So we just join in this congregation, all the other churches that might be doing this this, this morning, and we just ask you to bless us for this and encourage us. And we just pray for this in Jesus Christ. Amen. As with the bread, please keep your cup and then we take it all together as one bite. In the same way, 
after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let us take the cup of the Lord. going to sing another song, Nothing But The Blood, um, and while we're, while we're singing this song, we'll take up the offering. If, if you're visiting here, don't feel obliged, no worries, bless you. Before I start, I'd like to say to James, it's a privilege. I remember when, when I came to church and you were little. <laughs> and now he's leading our congregation. One of the deacons, Mary, with the daughter. And when I came to church, I, um, I became recently a dad. In like two weeks, I was, uh, my son was born. And, um, and now I have a, a, an extra daughter now. Three daughters and a son, so it's 
beautiful to live as a family here, seeing each other grow as human beings that grow from young to ever young, <laughs> uh, but also to grow spiritually. And I like to also say when I remember when John Biggs, when I was thinking about staying at the church, and John Biggs said, "Stay, brother, stay." <laughs> And that was a real um, encouragement for me to be in this church. So I'd like to just to tell you that about our church. And let us encourage one another to continue in the work of the Lord. Uh, sometimes uh, we feel down, sometimes we have problems. But let us remember the good times when God is merciful. I'd like to welcome Samuel. Actually, I haven't seen Samuel for quite a while. Yes, Samuel. You, and I, uh, yes. Is over there, and um, I'd like to um, welcome him. Um, and hopefully, you're doing well in your studies as well. So, so I'm happy to see you. The um, the sermon this morning is very much a Baptist sermon. Why do I say this? Because Romans six, the first eleven verses talk about baptism and we Baptists are crazy about baptism aren't we <laughs> that's why we were called Baptists because we were the ones who said no adults should do baptism to me that was the real break from Rome because nobody was willing to go that far because baptism in the reformation time meant that you are breaking up with your own community. Because when you are baptized as a kid in, in the 1500s, 1600s, you were also claimed to be a citizen of that particular kingdom or that particular city state. So if you're getting baptized again, what are you saying? I'm not part of you guys. Also, by being baptized again, you are saying that I'm not going to pay any tithes to the kingdom or to the city. And by being baptized again, you also said, I'm not going to war for you. In the 1500s, there were issues with the Muslims, as some of us know that we have today. But they were right in Vienna, at the gates of Vienna, trying to conquer that part of Europe trying to get into the middle of Europe to conquer it. So the reformers, some of the reformers like Martin Luther, Swingley, and, um, and Calvin, were angry at those people who were rebaptizing themselves again. Because they said, we are claiming our allegiance not to the city of Geneva, not to Wittenberg, not to the Holy Roman Empire, but we're claiming our allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And these other good reformers, I'm not saying that they're bad, but they had an issue with that. No, no, you can't. You have to fight. I'm not, I don't know if you're a pacifist or not. I just want to leave it there. But that was the issue of being baptized again in the 1500s. People were killed because of that. It's estimated that maybe 100,000 in one go were killed because they were doing baptism as adults, killed by both sides, by Catholics and Protestants. So if you wanted to be a uh, Anabaptist or a Baptist in England in the 15 and 1600s, it was dangerous, very dangerous. We know uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, I think was, was the name of the guy who wrote it? John Bunyan, John yes. He was in jail when he wrote it. Why? Because of his Christian convictions. And he, he wasn't living under a Catholic country regime. No, he was living under the Protestant one. So what does baptism mean to you? What does Paul say that it means to the believer? Of course, they were not. They were no Baptists at the time of of, um, of 
of Jesus or of Paul. It's funny how uh, I saw a, uh, a picture today, uh, not actually today, this week, uh, on Facebook, of this guy uh, bearing a Bible. And the picture said under it, this is so-and-so believer bearing the King James Bible during the time of Paul. Because <laughs> some people believe that uh, Baptists come from even even the, even from John the Baptist, but no, Paul is talking about believers. From chapter six, he starts saying, "What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin." And then he tells us how we die to sin by verse uh, by verse two, by verse three. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized? into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death or in, or in order that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father we too may live in your life so what happened at baptism oh no I just went down the beach it was cold yes Raj where are you yes it was cold or Natalie or whoever has done baptism lately, it was cold and, and it was a nice day. Everybody came to the party and, and everybody was happy because I became a member of the church. No, later. <laughs> no, something greater happened. You die when you went down. You, in God's sight, you die. Your old self is gone. And when you come back, it says, for we, verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. So you come back to life. So you die to another way of living. And you came back to life into a new way of living. Many of us are migrants here. Migrants, uh, you come from... New Zealand, I don't see New Zealand as another country, but anyway. <laughs> you come from New Zealand, and, um, or you come from the um, Netherlands, or you come from India, China, uh, Croatia, uh, where else? Um, Korea, Scotland, yes, England, South Africa, where else? Where else? Uh, Philippines, Greece, where else? Malaysia, yes. Um, who am I missing? Am I missing someone? Generation Australians. Uh, generation Australians, yes. But who, who? Oh, Poland, yes. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear. Yes, 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 yes. Anyone else? So we, many of us, come from different countries. But you, but the thing is, this the, 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 the thing. We have to get used to a new way of life. We have to get used to new laws. When I became an Australian, the only thing they asked me was, do you have $50? $50. That's all I needed. That's all they asked when I became an Australian. So I paid, and in a month's time, I became an Australian. But when my wife became an Australian, she needed to know uh, five um, responsibilities and five, um, uh, what is it? Does anybody know? Uh, does anybody became recently an Australian? And, and five duties. Five duties of an Australian and five responsibilities. And five, and, and five no, no. duties and, and benefits. So she had to know what she needed to do, but she had to know what the, off, what the country offered her. And I remember when she was there, she forgot that the guy just kept giving her hints. <laughs> But when you become a Christian, you have to get used to this new way of life. And that's where Paul picks up on chapter on verse 12 of chapter 6. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Evil desires. See, sin is not something that, that we can see. Sin is something like an energy, isn't it? Something that drives you towards acting the way that 
God doesn't approve. Evil desires sometimes define us. You're a thief. You're a liar. You're an adulterer. You're a gossip. You are a murderer. Murderer. And that was, uh, sorry for my accent. <laughs> you kill. You're a killer. So sin defines who we are. But we are called not to be like that. And what does it say? Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. But Romans 8.13 says, Put to death your mortal bodies. And where did our mortal bodies die, according to the Bible? According to chapter 6 of, of Romans? We read it. Where? In the waters of baptism. That's where your mortal body died. But we like to keep a souvenir. We like to keep holding on to our past lives. And I'm saying, even, even I who have grown up in church, who as a kid I used to go to church three times a day, my mom used to take me. And when I grew up, I said, why do I sing if I grew up in church? Because sin is something that we have in our bodies, in our cells. It's something that we bring from our parents. And that's why Paul, uh, yeah, Paul in chapter 5, he's talking about Adam. That's where sin comes from. In, for us, for us humans. Our mortal bodies include all, all of our limbs. But as well as our thoughts, emotions, imagination. That's why, do you remember some, some, some of you who have some Catholic friends and also Lutherans, uh, some Lutheran churches, uh, they, they, when they do the communion prayer, they say, forgive our, our sins in thought, word, and deed. Because out of the hearts come all the good things, yeah? Out of the heart come murder and uh, thieving and every, everything else. And we're going to see how God wants to change our heart. So we must not offer our, offer them to sin, our, our, our bodies, rather than to God. See verse 13. Do not offer any part of yourself. Don't offer any part. Don't you dare offer any part of yourself. Not your thoughts, not your words, not your deeds. Don't offer anything. When you see that, like, the hand is trying to... Um, <laughs> I saw, I saw this movie where this guy had a arm transplant and then he started killing people because the because the, the hand came from a murderer so he started killing everybody. <laughs> so when you see that your hand is starting to, to, to drive into sin. I was telling someone at work, because at work there's a lot of Christians. I'm happy for that, a lot of Christians and sometimes we meet, they ask me stuff. Actually they ask me, they always ask me when they're gonna preach. They, they want me to do their, their exegesis for them. <laughs> so, but I said to them, you know how serious this is? Do you know how serious this is that Jesus says, if your hand causes you to sin, what do you have to do? Because it's better to go without a hand into the kingdom of God than having your whole body burned in hell. This is how serious this thing is. If your eye causes you to sin, go take it out. And you know, a lot of people took that literally. And you know as well that even though you may cut somebody's hands, they'll find another way to steal. They always find a way. We always find a way to steal. So we must not uh, allow ourselves to be used, to be instruments. I like how this says, do not open any part of yourself as an instrument, as an instrument of wickedness. And this word instrument can also mean as a weapon, as a weapon of wickedness. Because this is a war. We are at war with Satan, are we? We are at war with darkness. It's either them 
for us. There's no in between. But rather, offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. From death to life. Where, where is the death? B baptism. That's where we die. Baptism. And offer every part of yourself. See, he says, don't offer any part of yourself. But now he's saying, offer every part of yourself to him as instrument of righteousness. And that's what I enjoyed this morning. We sang a song that we mentioned that Jesus is our righteousness. He is our righteousness. And this word is very deep. I'm not going to go into it, but this word has a lot of meanings. And, we, and, and when we were doing, I was doing this sermon, and I said, to my, I said to my wife, do you know that there's no such thing as righteousness in Spanish? There's no such word in Spanish. And, we, and I, read, I read the Spanish Bible, uh, which I keep beside the English one. There's no, there's no word for righteousness. That's why we are unrighteous. <laughs> I mean, the concept of righteousness doesn't exist in Spanish. It says justice. Justo. Justice. But righteousness is not just. It's a, it's, 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 it's a very close-minded world. And this has created a lot of issues in the last, how many years? 30 years? 40 years now. Since 1977, this uh, the, about the new perspective on Paul. This word righteousness has created so many, many, many debates. A, a lot of ink has been spilled over it. A lot of people have called each other heretic because of that. But let's keep it simple. All I want is Christ's righteousness. Because I'm not good enough. And I will never be good enough to God. Only Jesus is good enough. And if I glory with Jesus' righteousness, I'm pretty sure I'm going to heaven. And so are you. See, verse 14 goes back. It says, For sin shall no longer be your master. Because you are not under the law, but under grace. And in the last verse, and the last verse of this passage, it picks up on that word, grace. And grace is such a beautiful word because it's a word that even at this time, this culture didn't practice. We can blame everybody for our faults. But we deserve what we get. We can blame my mom or dad because they raised me this way. But at the end of the day, the judge doesn't send your mom or dad to jail if you steal or kill. He sends you. Yes, they're going to pay if they did something wrong. But what the judge does has to be righteous. He has to condemn you. But I saw something this morning that really touched me. This woman got her son died, was killed in a gang accident. He was just a standing by. He was a standing by in the U.S. And then the government cuts off her payment. Why? Because your son died, so you have to come back and tell us how much money you're making him. And while she's there fighting for her payment, she, she gets a tip, a parking ticket. And because she doesn't have money, she has to go to the tribunal for, um, to keep her apartment. And while she's at the tribunal, she gets another ticket and loses the apartment because she doesn't have any money. And then after that, she goes to see a lawyer because tribunal you can you can argue you know but so she needed to a place to live so she goes to, to see the lawyer and she gets another ticket because things take time and she doesn't have money 
So she goes before the judge. And the judge says to her, you have to pay $400. Because you owe the city this much. And then this woman starts crying. And she says, you know, I just lost my son. I lost the income. And I'm still paying. It's been a year and I'm still paying for his funeral. Cannot get over this. And now, on this day, I got four tickets. It's $400. What am I going to do? And the judge is touched and he says, I will reduce this to $50. For 400 to 50? Wow, it sounds a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good deal. But the judge goes a bit beyond and asks her, Are you going to be out of, my, out of pocket, out of money, if I charge you this? And she says, You leave me only with $5 on my pocket. And I have to live with that for two weeks. So the judge says, I'll write it off. You don't have to pay anything anymore. If that human judge can be so merciful, for $400, taking into account that her son died, was killed, unjustly, unjustly. How much our Heavenly Father will forgive our sins if we bring them to Him. At Bern, there was a man because they move around so people come and go. And he wouldn't take communion. And I asked him, why don't you take communion? And he told me, I have sinned. And yes, it was a big sin. And I asked him, but don't you think that Jesus' blood is powerful enough to clean you? And he never thought about that. And it was very encouraging that Sunday when he cried when he took communion. Because communion, my brothers and sisters, it's not just a piece of bread and a piece of um, juice and a cup of juice, no. Communion defines who we are as the people who died once and came back to life and no longer live in sin. And if we do, I like what Calvin says. John Calvin was right on this. I said that he was wrong in something. But he's, he got something right. That when we eat communion by faith, we're asking the Lord Jesus come into us and change us. I want to eat this because the Lord promised that whoever eat this will eat finally with him in the kingdom. And no matter what I do, no matter how much I sin, if I confess my sins and turn away from them, God is merciful and he'll forgive us our sins. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Here? Over there, do you believe that? Isn't that enough to come to church? To come and see that the Lord is merciful. And then he goes here, for sin shall no longer be your master. We don't have sin as master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace, that judge had grace upon this woman. And now we need a God of grace in our lives. And we're going to see what grace is. What then, verse 15, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, slaves, who likes to be a slave? Sometimes when the boss tells me something, I get mad because oh, I'm a problem, I'm a slave. <laughs> but he pays me because he owes me. But I'm not a slave. But we are working to get something. So he owes the, the bosses or whatever, they owe us, they owe us money. 
Do you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to happiness? No. Sin doesn't lead to happiness. Sin leads to death. The one thing that no one can come back from. Only Jesus. But for him, no one comes back from death. So sin leads to death. Or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. There's this word again, righteousness. Keeps on coming up. Sin is our enemy. Righteousness is what we are. I think I'm going to have to give something uh, to you, so some of this one, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying a lot of things. I'm, I'm seeing things on the text right now. And I think my exegesis is in Greek, and now I'm seeing all the things. It says, But thanks be to God that to you, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. You obey from here. You don't obey because. I have, to, I, have to, I have to be a good guy because or else people are going to take me away from, from being a deacon. I have to be a good boy this week because I'm going to play or I'm going to do this or that in church. No. We do it because we have a new heart. Verse 17. Paul already says about these people that they do outside of the service. They do, they go to church, or they go to the temple, they go to the temple, they go to the things, they, 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 they do the prayers, and that's it. Once you get out of the door, you go back to your old way of life. Once you step on that car, I know people, not in the church, of course. And it's true, it's true, not in the church. <laughs> it's true, I'm not saying that in the past, that after leaving church, they used to go to places of sin. And I couldn't understand why. Why? Why do you do that? Why do you do that? If you are a new creation in God. And some people don't see any, any, any issues with that. Oh, oh I, 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 I'm weak. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. Remember communion? This is my blood, which is shed for you. That's how much he paid. So you wouldn't be living the life of sin that we live. And I love how, how this thing says here. But thanks be to God that to you used to be slaves of sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. And I, when I read this, I said, oh man, I got this book this week. I usually get a book a week. And, uh, and, and, and the, the name of this book is Salvation by Allegiance. And uh, again, it, uh, the, um, the author says that faith could be also translated as allegiance. We claim our allegiance to Jesus because we have moved from the kingdom of darkness to the new kingdom. So our allegiance is to a new king. Who has Jesus as the king here? Who has Jesus as the king? Truly, I, are you? Because you know what, my brothers and sisters, if you think it, and, I, I, and, I, and um, you're going to see here at the end, if, if, if you think in, in, in our um, so coming forth, like, who's your, uh, who, who's your king? Jesus! I know, I know I'm not very out, out there. <laughs> but if you are afraid of doing it here, in church, where everybody believes the same, where all of us praise the same, where all of us worship the same God, how what's going to happen outside? When they ask you, who do you owe your allegiance? 
Who? No, no one there. What? Our forefathers went to their dead saying, Jesus is king. Jesus Caesar is not. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is king. So at work, at church, at school, in the playground, wherever, who's your king? Jesus? No one else. No one else. No one else will we owe allegiance to. Why? Because there's only one who died on the cross for us and he came back to life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Again, listen, righteousness, righteousness, righteousness. We are a righteous people. Yeah, but I don't live like a righteous people. Yeah, but doesn't matter. You were born again in the waters of baptism. You die to sin and are born to live life in your life. I'm using an example. I like how, how Paul says this. I'm using an example for everyday life. He's like excusing himself because of your human limitations. Ooh, imagine me preaching like that. Your human limitations. No, but this is Paul, okay? Not me. Because of your human limitations. Yes, and you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity. You used to offer yourselves to, uh, to, used to, offer yourselves to impurity, to, to ever increasing wickedness. So we run to sin. Oh, well, uh, I mean, those, those those who have issues with maybe alcohol, oh, there's a party, boom, where's the alcohol? Or, or, or those who have an issue with uh, gambling, oh, where's the gambling, oh, where's the cars, boom. Oh, you, you run, you run. Do you run to church? Do you run? Oh, there, there, there's a Bible study, you run to it. Do you, uh, there's a prayer, you run to it. <coughs> all of us. No, 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 I'm not talking about this. Is, this goes around. <laughs> Bounces all over the place. Do we run to do things that will help you for eternal life? Or you think, ah, let me see, uh, do I need to pray? Do I? Do? Yes, we do. So now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness. Verse by verse by verse, it keeps on going with the same thing, righteousness. That's what we are, we're righteous people in God's sight. Leading to holiness. What benefit did you reap at the time from the things you are not ashamed of? Those things result in death. <coughs> Sin leads to death. I see people who die because they sin. I had a family, a very removed family member who died from AIDS. I had a known people who, who die after they had a big party and they were drunk, they come and you, you, know, you, you know the statistics here in Australia. Which are pretty moderate compared to where I come from, which in Holy Week, more than a thousand people die because they're drunk, because they fight. That's wickedness. So what did we reap from the time of the things you were ashamed of? Those things we saw in death. But now you have been set free from sin. It's not that, it, this is the thing. In Paul's view, which is God's view at this time. You are free from sin. We are free from sin. But there's something, in the, he goes on to chapter 7 to talk about it. There's something in our bodies that make us, you know, sin. And as baptized believers, we are not forgiven. We are not forgiven. Because there's power that lives in us. The power of the Holy Spirit. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness. 
and the result is a good time at church. Yeah, maybe. Today, this morning was very beautiful. We sang, we praised. But there's another one beyond that. Eternal life. And let me conclude with this that I found so, com so compelling. For the wages of sin is death. And he's picking up on previous verses, in, in previous passages, Romans 5, 23, where he talks about wages as well. Actually, uh, not 5, 23, 14. <laughs> says, this uh, 22, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. We are credit. We're not owe anything. God doesn't owe anybody. He doesn't pay anybody because he doesn't look. Because he owns everything. For the wages of sin is dead, but the gift, the gift, this is a gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. Do you desire the gift? Do you desire the gift? Because that's the gift that we came to know Jesus for. Oh, I was going to die. I was going to have eternal death because of these, uh, because of my sins. But then Jesus came up and I found salvation. Salvation does not only mean that you, yes, God can fix our marriages, God can fix our, 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 our way of life. Because there's some people who criticize those preachers that they go a bit overboard. But yes, in, in my case, one of the things that, um, that I've seen in Latin America and in Africa is that when people come to Christ, they stop drinking. They stop going with other women. They stop going to, to waste their money. And the family gets better. They have more income. They are more united. That's part of Jesus breaking down the chains of sin within the family. And you can expect that when you come to Christ. But that doesn't stop there. We have eternal life. But to whom? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. So who's going to be our Lord, my brothers and sisters? Sin? We're going to get a wage from sin. Sin is going to pay us with death. But Jesus God, through Jesus, gives us, who didn't deserve it, who didn't ask for it, who were looking for it, he gave us, through Jesus, eternal life. This is my challenge to our church. Let's make Jesus Lord not only when we sing here, not only when we're together, but Lord at every moment of our lives and with all our bodies. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that through your Holy Spirit you will empower us, Lord, <coughs> to overcome sin in our lives to help one another as the word says that if one of us sin let us the rest of us restore him or her in your ways let us be a church lord that encourage us to live holy and let us be lord the church of the redeemed that you gave new life at their baptism this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We sing our final song. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Great thing he has done. He died on the cross. He gave us eternal life. Please stand.
your playing this morning. It was wonderful. How many? How many yes. enjoyed? Yes. Thank you for uh, giving us your gift, Jesus. To Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever. Amen. Amen.